APGO basic science video topic, endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia. Abnormal uterine bleeding accounts for one-third of outpatient gynecology visits. When women are perimenopausal or postmenopausal, this increases to 70% of gynecology consults. Malignancy and hyperplasia risks increase with age. In this video, we will focus on abnormal bleeding that arises secondary to endometrial hyperplasia, as well as endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, previously known as atypia, and its potential for progression to estrogen-dependent type 1 endometrioid endometrial cancer. The objectives of this video are, describe the normal histology of the endometrium and the changes that occur throughout the menstrual cycle, describe the histopathology and pathophysiology of endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, and understand the role of progestins in treating hyperplasia. To review the normal menstrual cycle and the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, please see the APGO educational topic number 45 on normal and abnormal uterine bleeding, number 54 on endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma, and the APGO basic science video on the HPO axis. Let's meet our patient. Ms. Edna Metrium is a 47-year-old gravida 2 para 2 with past medical history significant for polycystic ovarian syndrome and obesity with a body mass index of 39 kilograms per meter squared. She presents to clinic with irregular bleeding. For the last four months, her bleeding has been unpredictable. She has been having daily bleeding with variable flow, sometimes light and sometimes heavy with clot. Prior to the last few months, she has had periods every two to three months. A pregnancy test in clinic is negative. To really understand abnormal bleeding, it's important to first understand what's normal. Let's start by reviewing the normal histology of the endometrium. The endometrium is hormonally active and composed of simple columnar epithelium with simple tubular glands. Zooming out, you can see that it is composed of two layers, the stratum functionale and the stratum basale. The stratum functionale is a temporary layer at the surface of the uterine lumen. It fluctuates with hormones and sheds during menses. The stratum basale is a deeper permanent layer. It contains the basal portion of the endometrial glands and is retained during menses. Throughout the menstrual cycle, the endometrium fluctuates in response to hormones. Using this diagram, we will be able to look at these changes. In the top half, we will be looking at the ovary and hormones, and the bottom half, we will be looking at the endometrium. The menstrual cycle is generally broken into two parts, before ovulation and after ovulation. Before ovulation, the endometrium is considered proliferative, and the ovaries are in the follicular phase. Following ovulation, there is secretory endometrium, and the ovaries are in the luteal phase. What does this all mean? Recall that following menses, the ovaries are quiet, producing low levels of progesterone and estradiol. As follicles are recruited for ovulation, there is increased estradiol production, with a dramatic increase at the end of the follicular phase as the dominant follicle is selected. The rising estrogen results in proliferation of the endometrium. Endometrial glands are not crowded with a less than 50% ratio of glands to stroma, and the spiral arteries are typically straight to slightly coiled and tubular. Progesterone remains low in the follicular phase. Following ovulation, the corpus luteum forms in the ovary and produces progesterone with maximal levels at the mid-luteal phase. The corpus luteum also produces a moderate amount of estradiol. If pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum regresses and there's a significant drop in both progesterone and estradiol. During the rise in progesterone, the endometrium transforms into secretory tissue in preparation for possible implantation of pregnancy. The glands become increasingly tortuous and may have a greater than 50% glands to stroma ratio. The spiral arteries that feed the endometrium increase in number and coiling. Let's pause, read, and apply. Why does the endometrium shed during menses? The fall of progesterone by the corpus luteum results in the collapse of endometrial glands. The decline in progesterone also results in constriction of the spiral arteries, leading to local ischemia of the stratum functionale, resulting in endometrial sloughing. Let's go back to our patient. In addition to labs and ultrasonography for evaluation, you recommend proceeding with an endometrial biopsy because of her abnormal bleeding. She asks you why she needs this procedure. What information will it tell us? You discuss with her that endometrial biopsy is recommended for women over the age of 45 with abnormal uterine bleeding. You discuss with her that the risk for endometrial cancer increases with age, and that a biopsy can help diagnose precursors as well as cancer itself. 
It is important to note that endometrial biopsy is also recommended for women younger than 45 with abnormal uterine bleeding if they have increased risk factors for endometrial cancer, such as women with obesity or chronic anovulation. She agrees to the biopsy. This is her biopsy. It is consistent with benign endometrial hyperplasia. Let's take a moment to review the different schema of premalignant endometrial lesions. Traditionally, the WHO 1994 schema broke down premalignant lesions into four categories. In the WHO 94 schema, lesions are classified based on glandular complexity and nuclear atypia. There is simple hyperplasia without atypia, complex hyperplasia without atypia, simple hyperplasia with atypia, and complex hyperplasia with atypia. More recently, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has recommended using the endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia diagnostic schema. In this newer schema, there is benign endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, or EIN. The reason for this shift is to distinguish between benign versus premalignant lesions and to classify lesions in a way that informs treatment decisions. For women with benign endometrial hyperplasia, the risk to progression of cancer is low less than 5%. This develops secondary to estrogenic stimulation of the endometrium, unopposed by progestins. As seen on this slide from our patient, there are proliferative glandular epithelial changes. Glands are labeled with the letter G and the stroma with the letter S. Let's pause, read, and apply. How does her history of polycystic ovarian syndrome and obesity increase her risk for hyperplasia and malignancy? Both PCOS and obesity increase the risk for unopposed estrogen. PCOS is associated with chronic anovulation. Without ovulation, there is no development of a corpus luteum and therefore no progesterone to cause orderly shedding of the endometrium. Obesity causes an increase in risk secondary to the presence of aromatase in adipose tissue. It converts androstenedione, an androgen, to estrone, which is then converted to estradiol. Other common risks include nulliparity, tamoxifen therapy, early menarche, and late menopause. Benign hyperplasia treatment strategies include removing exogenous sources of estrogen and treatment with progestins, which will treat the underlying condition and also improve her bleeding pattern. Progestins counterbalance the proliferative effects of estrogens and induces secretory differentiation of the endometrium. The diagnosis of endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia is a separate entity and is consistent with atypia in the 1994 WHO schema. This is considered a premalignant lesion with a 27% risk of progression to endometrioid endometrial cancer. In fact, about 40% of patients with EIN may already have underlying carcinoma since endometrial biopsy only samples a portion of the endometrium. How is EIN diagnosed? As you can see in this slide, there is a greater than 50% gland to stroma ratio resulting in gland crowding. In addition, there is altered cytology of the crowded glands compared to background normal glands such as an increased nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. Look at the differences between this normal background gland circled in red compared to the crowded glands. Pathogenesis of EIN is similar to hyperplasia in which unopposed estrogen is implicated. There's also evidence for inactivity of tumor suppressor genes. Because of the increased risk of concurrent malignancy and increased risk for progression, treatment is with total hysterectomy. This assesses for possible concurrent cancer and effectively treats premalignant lesions. For women who desire future fertility, or for women who are unable to undergo surgery due to other health issues, progestin therapy with close follow-up and repeat sampling is recommended. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on endometrial hyperplasia and EIN. We have covered a lot, including the histology of normal endometrium and the changes that occur during the menstrual cycle the histopathology and pathophysiology of hyperplasia and EIN, and the role of progestins in the treatment for hyperplasia.